Hey everybody and welcome to my second of two videos on this, the Konica Auto Reflex T3. In the first video we talked about what everything on the camera is and in this video we're going to talk about what it does and how to use it. First thing we're going to do is we're going to change the battery. The battery in this camera is only used to power the light meter. Now for those of you who are really super astute, you'll have noticed something strange right off the bat. This camera says to only use PX675, which are the old Mercury Cell 1.35 volt batteries. They are the same size as that battery cap, and that does not add up. So it's saying to use the Mercury Cell batteries, but they don't fit in this. There are two LR44s in there. I think it's two. Yeah, LR44 batteries in there right now. And that's what this camera, this camera takes. So I am not sure if this camera was modified at some point in the past to take the modern non-mercury batteries or what, but for whatever reason, this camera has a big warning about which mercury batteries to use and it doesn't use them. So, um, if your camera does use the mercury cell batteries, that's these guys right here, and there are a few different options. You can use the modern batteries, but if you do, then they will not meter correctly because the voltage is too high, they will cause your images to be underexposed. So if you use the modern batteries or a dumb adapter with an A76, AG13, or whatever in it, which is another option, also 1.5 volts. You're going to have to compensate for your over for your um, over voltage batteries. The way to do that is on a sunny day, go outside, know what film speed you have. We have it 400 in here right now. Let's say if you're using 400, you set your film your shutter speed to 1 500th and your aperture to f16. If you're using one, 100 ISO, then you select 1 125th. If you're using 50, you select 1 60th. Just select the number that is closest to your film ISO and F16. Now with the sun at your back, you find a scene that's evenly illuminated and then you adjust your ISO dial until you have a proper meter reading. And that will allow you to trick your camera into giving you a proper meter reading with the wrong voltage batteries. The downside to that is that you lose some of your ISO range, but you don't have to pay to have the camera modified or buy one of these expensive $30 to $40, well, two of these expensive $30 to $40 voltage adapting battery adapters. Here are a couple of other battery adapters. This guy right here simply holds two LR34 batteries and would fit in here just fine if this had the mercury cell battery chamber. And this one has, is the voltage adapting type. You would need two of these, which is about an $80 investment. At that point, it's not gonna cost you a meaningfully greater amount of money to find a repairman who will take this apart on the underside and pop in a literally a $2 part, a resistor, a $2 resistor to um, to modify the circuitry, you could pro. I haven't opened up this camera. I don't know how easy it would do to be that on your. How easy it would be to do that on your own if you're confident with a soldering iron, but it's always good to have a repairman do that. If they want a hundred bucks for it to modify your camera, that should be just fine. You're not going to buy eighty bucks in voltage adapting adapters and then lose them twice a year like I do. At any rate, you're basically paying for years of camera repairman expertise when you do that. So those are the batteries. And like I said, I, I don't understand why mine has AG13 357 type batteries in it, but everything I've read says it uses the mercury cells. But hey, I'm not looking a gift horse in the mouth. So the next thing you wanna do after you load the better batteries is set your shutter speed to 1 125th and your ISO to 100, just like that. And then we're going to check our batteries. And to do that, you push this all the way into the inside. You put it in lock. And then it's easiest to do that holding the camera this way and then just push it in like that. And if your batteries are good, 
then it should go, you should get something that goes up to the, your needle should go up to the uh, battery check thing. So that's how we change the batteries. Next thing we're gonna do is mount and unmount the lens. So when you have a lens on here, you find your lens release button there, and then you turn it counter or anti-clockwise to remove it. To remount the lens, you wanna find that red dot and this red dot there, line them up, drop the lens in place, turn it until it clicks, and you've mounted a new lens. You can do that at any time when you're not taking a photo, not during a, an actual exposure, without affecting the, Im the images on your film because there's a, a shutter between the lens and the film that prevents light from reaching the film when your lens is off of your camera. Next thing we're gonna do is load and unload film, and I'll show you how film works in this camera. So we're gonna open up the back of the camera, gonna grab our cassette here, and just pop it into the cassette chamber. There we go. Pull out a little leader, feed it into the take-up spool. There we go. Oh, just last video I was saying how foolproof this was, and look at, look at that. It is not foolproof. I've proven. So we're gonna feed the leader into the take-up spool like that. Ah, third time's a charm, promise. There we go. Not exactly the way it's supposed to work, but it, it happened and did well. Okay, I'm gonna close the film back and now we're going to advance from start to frame one. And you know things are advancing if this turns as you advance the camera. And this new problem is causing me uh, some heartburn right now. There we go. So we've got the film advanced to frame four. You wanna take a, any tension out of your film like that. You don't wanna crank it, you just wanna turn it until you feel resistance. And then you wanna set your ISO to whatever your film speed is. There we go, 200. And we're ready to go. And now you're ready to start shooting. So as you take pictures, you're going to go through your, your roll of film, taking multiple pictures. Now, film is one and done, and it can record an image as in one of two ways. It can record light in one of two ways, either in a controlled manner inside a camera with a shutter speed and aperture that result in an image, or in an uncontrolled manner by doing this. If you have film in your camera, don't open your film back, you'll erase all of the images on it. So from the time that you've got your film loaded onto the take-up spool until the time you've completely rewound it, don't open the film back. But I want you to see how your film moves through your camera when you take pictures like this. You can see it feeds off of the film cassette through these guide rails. The film pressure plate sandwiches it here. Tension's kept on here by the film tension sprocket and then it's taken up over here on the film take-up spool. Now when you've finished, again keeping your film back closed the whole time, you push the film rewind button in and now you can start rewinding it. And when you rewind your film, it just takes it through the camera back up into the cassette. That's the sound you'll hear when you're almost done. And in real life, you wanna rewind this, your leader all the way into the cassette. But I'm gonna reuse this film again for another video, so I won't. And then after you've removed your film cassette, you can grab another one and pop it in. Or if you're done for the day, then just trigger your shutter, close the film back and set your camera aside for the night until you use it again. All right, next thing let's talk about is how to use a flash with this camera. It does not have a hot shoe, as you can see, so that you cannot mount a flash directly onto the camera. There, if my eyepiece weren't missing, there is a way to, there is a piece that attaches here to the eyepiece that you, that's a cold shoe. So you can physically put a, a flash on the camera but not trigger it with the cold shoe. You can only trigger a flash with these PC ports right here. So any flash you're gonna use needs to have a cable in it that can connect to these ports. The only, the only port you want to use is X. If you plug a modern flash into M, it will not sync correctly, the timing will be off and your images will not turn out. 
So with a modern flash, you want to use your X port, connect it through a cable to your flash, and then take a picture. Some flash, some basic flash technique. Let's pretend that, uh, I guess, turn your head sideways for right now. So let's say you have a flash on top of your camera. If you trigger the flash, the light's gonna bounce up to your subject and back to your camera. And what's gonna happen is that the subject's gonna be lit very poorly. They're gonna look flat and waxy because the light's just going up and back. With a flash for this camera, it, because it needs a cable, you can hand hold it, put it off to the side, hold it wherever you want. That's very useful. Um, I almost always hand hold a flash when I use one. So, but if you wanted to, if you had one of these with the cold shoe and you wanted to mount a flash on it, you'd want to get a flash that articulates where the flash head can be adjusted. Because if you have your flash head bouncing the light up at the ceiling, and then back down, you're gonna get a more natural look. Whether you're outside under the sun or indoors under overhead lights, we are used to seeing people and anything we look at being lit from above. So if you use the flash to bounce the light up and back down and then back this way, you're gonna get a more natural look to your subject than you would bouncing the light up straight and back. Next thing I want to help you understand is how the flash physically works with the camera. Now, 1 125th is in red, and that's because that's your flash sync speed. So 1 125th and slower, you can use the flash. 250th, 500th, and 1,000th, you cannot use the X flash and have it work correctly. Now, the reason for that is because when your shutter, when your shutter speeds are set, they aren't controlled by the curtains moving faster or slower over the film plane. The curtain will always travel at the same speed. The shutter speeds are set by the amount of time between the first and second curtain. You advance your film and so forth. So if you advance your first curtain, and then, so let's say you're at 1 1 25th of a second right now. First curtain opens, and then for a very brief period of time, approximately 1 1 25th of a second, the entire film plane, which let's pretend what you're seeing is the entire film plane, is exposed to light. So the flash fires and then the light reaches the subject and comes back to your film plane and illuminates them. And then the second curtain closes and you advance your film. Well, if you do a half second exposure, curtain opens, the entire film plane is open to light for a half second, second curtain closes, advance your film, okay? So what about 1 1,000th? First curtain opens, second curtain comes in behind it, and like that. So if you used 1 1,000th of a second and triggered your flash, it might trigger, let's say, right here. And then you'd have just a strip of illuminated image in your photo, and then everything else that was blocked by the shutter curtains would be dark, and then advance your film. So you have to use a flash at 1 1 25th of a second or slower in order for the images to turn out properly with this camera because faster than 1 1 25th of a second, you'll only get a partial frame illuminated when you use the flash. Next thing let's do is look through the viewfinder on your T3, and this is a mock-up of what you would see looking through it. On the bottom is a shutter speed indicator. So if you adjust your shutter speed, that number on the bottom will change, and um, that lets you know what your shutter speed is. On the right side, there is an aperture window. So that's gonna tell you what aperture you're set to, or what aperture you should be set, set to, rather, with your shutter speed. So take your camera and look at a part of your room. Like if you have a, an overhead light, take a look at that overhead light, okay? And if your room is illuminated like mine, then at 1 250th of a second and f5.6, with 200 ISO film, you should be overexposing your image. So then if you take a look at, say, your wall, you'll find that you have a different number. So if I look at the light, it tells me f11 at 1 250th of a second. If I look at the wall, it tells me f5.6 at 1 250th of a second, okay? The, and then the needle will just tell you what your aperture should be with your shutter. So what you have to do is then make sure that 
you have actually set your aperture correctly with your your shutter with your um, shutter speed inside the viewfinder itself the on the t3 in the center is a a prism focusing area that prism focusing area if your subject is in focus in that prism area it's in focus if it's not in focus then it will look like there's triangles on top of your subject and that's the way that the prism tells you whether or not something is or isn't in focus around it is just a slightly different grind uh, is an area with a slightly different grind to the rest of the mat that lets you know what your center weighted metering area is and then the balance of the focusing screen is just a standard mat in both the center weighted area and the standard mat if your um, subject is in focus you'll be able to tell just by looking at it it will will appear to be in focus on the focusing screen there all right so the next thing we're going to do is talk about how to take a photo with your t3 taking a photo with a t3 is pretty easy all you have to do is take your meter reading set your shutter speed and aperture correctly to whatever you need them to be then you're going to focus on your subject there we go oops and take a picture and that's how you take a photo with the Konica T3 it is uh, really easy to do so what about multiple exposures glad you asked multiple exposures on this camera are pretty easy but first we need to understand a little bit about how they work if you have 1 1 25th of a second and f5 6 as a proper single exposure and you take a photo and then advance it that's a proper exposure if you do two exposures at that setting you will your film will receive too much light it will be a very dark negative which means that when you digitize it you'll have artifacts or you risk having artifacts you'll have lower contrast and when you print it in a dark room it will take a lot longer to print and you'll also have lower contrast so you want to still have a proper exposure on your negative even with a double exposure so you need to compensate for that double exposure it's really easy on this camera because if 1 1 25th and f5 6 is a proper exposure you just have to cut the amount of light in half i tend to do that with the shutter speed because i prefer to use aperture for creative control and on the shutter dial if you're at 1 1 25th and need half as much light it's 1 2 50th because these are fractions the higher the number the the faster the speed the less light and every time you go up a number it's half as much light so you can either go to 1 2 50th or if you want to keep the shutter speed you could go to f8 same thing every time you go up a number it's half as much light so whichever way you prefer you can do that you take your first photo multiple exposure switch you got to hold it while you advance take your second photo and now you advance next thing you need to do is grab your lens cap put it on and take a dead frame and then advance and now the reason that you take a dead frame is that when you take your when you advance after your double exposure the film might not advance the whole way so your next exposure risks overlapping the double exposure so you take a dead frame so that you advance it and that's because the gearing doesn't necessarily catch instantly and start taking up the film right away so you advance and then you advance again and then you have fresh film for your photo after your double exposure which prevents you from ruining both your double exposure and your next frame so that's how you take a double exposure with this camera and you know what ain't nothing else to talk about we've gone over everything you can do with this camera so if this video and this video series were helpful please give me a thumbs up that lets me know i'm on the right track and that i'm producing content which is helpful and useful to you if you have questions or comments please leave those below i'm pretty good about checking on my comments every day or two if you have ideas or suggestions for future videos please also leave those below and if i have the equipment and technical know-how i'm more than happy to do that if you'd like to find out when i have more videos about cameras including when i eventually do a review of the t3 with photos by all means please subscribe and turn on your notifications and one last thing thank you everyone for watching and i'll see you in the next camera series